Hello, and welcome to Remainders, where we talk everything film. Today, we're going to be talking the 63 Up documentary and the Up series as a whole, which I am very excited for. My name is Patrick. With me is always the uh, amazing art background uh, and ta multi-talented Darren Farrell. How are you doing, bud? I'm doing excellent. Great to see you today. And hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Up series, the latest installment in the Up series. This is a uh film series that i had not seen before however i have heard about it mainly through patrick who has been talking about it for years uh and i've known about it only through that channel that's that you love this series have i i mean i feel like i talk about it in passing um and i always I, re I remember thinking how cool the idea was that somebody decided to film people from the age of seven all the way through the end of their life, basically, um, thus far. Wow. And so I just think that idea is so great. And obviously, um, a fan, I know we're both fans of Boyhood and different things that Link Ladder has done, you know, dealing with time and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. I had not seen any of these until I watched uh, the movie that we're discussing today, 63 Up, last night. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, I'm definitely excited to hear your take on it. So just, I mean, just a little background. Um, the Up series, it started in 1963 with a group of, I believe, 12 uh, seven-year-olds. And the stated purpose was to uh, study the British class system at the time. You know, they had uh, kids, seven-year-olds from different backgrounds, some poor, some very privileged and rich. And it was supposed to be kind of a one-off documentary studying that. But uh, Michael Apted, um, he was, I believe it was like a PA uh, or researcher on the first um, documentary. It was just a random job for him. And he ended up um, pretty much directing every subsequent installment uh, as they revisit this uh, cohort every seven years to see where their lives have gone uh, since 1963. And it is, um, yeah, it's, it's a special kind of uh, series that, I mean, I, I saw, uh, it first when it was 49 up, um, I think it was 2005. So this would have been, I guess we would have already left Sun Coast at that time. Um, I think it was shortly after that. And I remember renting it and being blown away by the, the existence of this documentary that they've been following these people, uh, for, 40 years at that point and almost uh 60 years at this point and it's one i've kept up with since then and like you said you're seeing this for the first time now and i'm curious to see kind of like what your reaction is because i think a huge part of this is watching these people grow you know and obviously this is your introduction to them but for a lot of older people maybe it's it, they've been following them for decades yeah for sure um coming through to you know experiencing this for the first time I, I remember last time we talked um in last episode i asked you if i had to see you know the the previous installments and you said yeah. no you know they kind of do the they'll give you a little bit of update about you know who these people are and where they were and then they 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 do a really good job of mixing in um you know points in their life that they are now at 63 Ugh. with going back and thinking about like what they had said in previous interviews or whatever about you know different subjects that they're talking about which is really cool you know to have that kind of film stock to go back to and be like no you know this is how you felt when you were this age or whatever and it does definitely make the you know it's a great thing for the audience yeah. to think about your own mortality and your own life and you know the dreams that you had when you were younger where you thought you'd be when you were, uh, you know, older and if you'd be married, do you want kids? All of these things that you think about in life, um, they alter as you grow. And that's kind of my favorite thing about this is just kind of seeing some people have stuck to their path in life and some people have not, you know, and um, also dealing with the class system, like you said, uh, this I, I noticed in 2019, I don't know very much about Brexit, but they uh, that's been a, a question that um, the director asks them in the interview questions quite often in the series, you know, how, how did you feel about Brexit? And because of the class system and everything, it's interesting that, you know, you've got different people and different walks of life. And, you know, again, you get to experience where they came out um 
towards the end of their life. Uh, and of course, as I'm watching this, I'm wondering, has anyone died? And of, and they do. Uh, I believe her name was Lynn. Uh, she mm -hmm. passed away by this by the time I did it. And then two years after, or two or three years after this was done, uh, our, our director passed away as well. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, a pretty big uh, surprise to me. Um, I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, like uh, think it back. Like um, yeah, I don't think you do need to watch the older ones, but re uh watching this one because i saw this in the theaters at the music box when it came out in 2019 um it every time i watch them it reminds me that the each film has kind of a different vibe and that's completely understandable because you're totally they're being interviewed at different stages of their lives and obviously everybody's their own person but there are plenty of similarities when every when you of people you sh of experiences you share with people of the same age. You know, there's kind of common uh, reoccurring things that kind of just happen to all of us. And I was thinking back to because uh, I watched the whole series once through, like shortly after I discovered it, and I haven't revisited any of the old ones, only watching the new ones as they came up. But like you, you see the similarities, like in the in their thirties. Uh, there were a couple episodes where it was basically half of the uh, interviews were them just kind of grappling with losing their parents because uh, that was just kind of a, you know, it was different for everybody, but that was like a common thread for a lot of people uh, in this cohort, at least uh, losing their parents for the first time. And so I, I think it would be, I mean, if, if you like this series, I think you actually would get a lot out of re uh, or, or seeing the older ones for the first time. Cause I think that just might add to it. Um and I know there are people who rewatch them religiously, but um, yeah, I haven't gone back to the old ones, but uh, they they hold a pretty special place in my head. Um, but then, yeah, as Lynn is the first person to have passed away in this cohort. And I remember like in the theater, like hearing like people like gasp because it was like um, oh, hmm. it was the first time um, that any of the major people in this uh, series has passed away and rewatching it this time, he it was so eloquently edited. It's like, he's showing her you know, a story of what she went through in the past, just like he did everybody else. And then he kind of started touching on, she had a little bit of illness and then just bam, like, so how has it been since your mother passed away? It just like kind of lays it on the viewer. And I remember the audience I was with just being like, a couple people just like ought to be like blown away by that because again it depends like you watching the first for the first time might be like you know this is just another person but like uh yeah, if people have grown up with this person right yeah. if you had been following this uh for decades like that would that would be kind of a big deal what was your what was your initial reaction when you heard that did you did you feel were you got like you didn't expect that right no not at all i mean i just i didn't uh I hadn't heard anything about that. It's not like I follow these characters outside of watching the films or anything. And it's not like it's major news or anything. So seeing it, that was a surprise to me. And, um, and then, yeah, we can kind of get into it. Michael Apted also passed away uh, after the filming of this one. And so, like I said, he's been the champion of this entire series since the beginning. So it is kind of in a state of flux right now in terms of like whether or not they're going to do 70 up. Yeah, I do. I do know that he had an assistant with him for a very long time that worked very close with, with him on these uh, on this series. So if there was going to be somebody to do, uh, do it, it would be her. Uh, I just haven't heard any news about that. It would be uh, in 2026 in two years would be the uh, time that it would happen if it does. Well, some things, too, that I noticed um you know, every once in a while, they talk about something that happened in the seven years where they'd be able to go back and like show footage of, um, uh, in particular in this series, when the two men who were uh, kind of talked about uh, in conjunction with each other, uh, they meet up in Australia. So at yeah. that point, that happened, you know, in the interim of what was happening in the seven years before this film. Uh, so I think, you know, there must have been a pulse on what everybody was doing throughout those seven years to be able to get some footage because that was filmed in between, you know, uh, actually doing this film so that they could go back and show that they showed the couples together in Australia. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I didn't think about that, actually. So glad, well, <laughs> you're, know, you're, you're puncturing holes. Maybe this is more fabricated than it. it well, because it I would I would. Well, I would think that. Yeah. So they they must have somebody ready to go 
and film something if it's a major life event, just in case they want to touch on that. You know, what I yeah, mean? that's true. I do know that they are very. Michael Apted was very close with everybody, understandably. Like he's been yeah. talking to these people since they were seven years old. Um, what is his quote? I mean, he's, I guess, fifteen years older than them because one of his quotes is, "I hope to do eighty four up when I'm ninety nine. Mm. And unfortunately, that won't happen. But that was just a context of like, he's certainly, you know, he's older than them, but only 15 years older. And then just be knowing them their entire lives. It's, I would, I would, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised that uh, there probably are check ins in the seven years. It's not like yeah. they just don't talk to each other in those seven years and then just sit down and lay it all on. Cause I guess the, the interview portion is those seven years. But yeah, they certainly could uh, maybe, um, and obviously they draw on lives, stuff yeah. that they've filmed in the past, but I think that in the interim, if there's like a life thing like you know, someone gets married or something like that, it's like, oh, we've got to have a camera there to make sure because that's going to be a big life event we're going to want to talk about. I mean, if you were just going to take the garbage out, no one's going to want to, you know, film yeah. that. But if it's a bigger thing, they may be checking in. Uh, that's what I don't Instagram's know. for when you take out your garbage on it every day. You just, this is right, what I'm exactly. doing. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the reason I bring that up is because I would have, I would think, you know, if it's going to be coming up in two years and if they are planning on to, to do it, you know, with maybe the assistant, like you mentioned, um, possibly that would be an easier transition than maybe we know because of the fact that maybe that that assistant has been taking care of, like going out and actually getting some stuff in the field, you know, getting ready for this new uh, this new installment. Um you know, because they were planning it before he died or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, I, I do know he's just had a close uh, group of people working on the series for a long time. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think they certainly would be able to do it. But again, Michael Apted was the through line. So, and, um, you know, he was, I mean, I guess I didn't realize he was pretty uh, established director outside of the series, too. I mean, I he, directed, he directed a Bond film, um, The World Is Not Enough, one of the Pierce Brosnans. He directed uh, Gorillas in the Mist. Um, yeah, he was, I mean, pretty uh, active, certainly as a director outside of this. But I think this is this is certainly what I know him the most from. Yeah, I sure. think this is what he's been mostly known for. But, you know, even like... Uh, pretty big stars like that movie Nell he did, I guess. And uh, that's with Jodie Foster. Yeah. I never saw uh, that. Yeah. Neither, neither have I, but uh, <laughs> there's just, a, I remember it being a bigger movie back when I was, I was younger, you know, when that movie yeah. came out. So um, you weren't going to see Nell when you were like eight. Or uh, something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, that other film with Sissy Spacek, I believe I forget the name of it uh, was a bigger one that he did, but you know, yeah. More coal miner's movies. daughter I yeah coal miner's did. daughter yeah that's that right one? yeah, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah and i remember that being a a bigger film of his so uh the idea that this film to follow these people is is nuts it's bananas you know that's why i remember that's, thinking yeah. about it a lot that you uh, had mentioned it somewhere in there you had talked about how much you liked these films and i had always stuck with me i think maybe just because of the premise you're going around and you're going yeah. to follow these people for your whole life and i'm like wow that's like such a it seems like such a big undertaking but in reality now that i can kind of step back it's like well you just have to kind of like follow up every seven years so hopefully if you live long enough you can do that you know what i mean well i mean it was an experiment and it's just one that he they kept on doing uh, you know, he talked about it like he was started to to study the British class system, but then it became something more personal. It became more about their individual lives rather than seeing whether or not they're born poor, die poor, or vice versa. Um, he still, I, I do, I I was, um, I did notice he he was a lot more direct uh, in this one in sixty three up than past. Um, uh films in terms of just asking them like do you think the purpose of this documentary is true do you think like what's the the tagline of it starts every single uh film since the original is show me the child of seven and i will show you the man so it's basically saying like show me uh this kid at seven what he's doing what he thinks and you can kind of get a pretty large glimpse of where he's going to end up at 63 and beyond and that's kind of the impetus of like why they started it and then it just became more so about their personal lives and the fact that it's still going on is part of the appeal of it you know it's like it's it, it's about time in no other way that any other art can do it because it's been going on since 1963. yeah and yeah. um i i mean at this point you're going to be seeing a lot more people 
not being with them anymore. But it was surprising that some people opted out of doing it altogether. Um, well, a lot of them like do not like doing it, and they're like they're pretty uh, candid about that too. Not in like a malicious way. They're just like, I mean, and I understand. It's like, why would you want? Uh, I guess. I mean, I'm also thinking it is it is different now in the world we live in with social media. You know, like in the last 15 years, when it's so common for people to just share their lives uh, on a screen for other people to watch, and that wasn't really an option for people before uh you know even 15 years ago yeah so the fact that they were on this giant platform every seven years we're just going to invite you in and say like this is what i'm doing with my life this is where i've been going and everybody it's going to be for the world to watch it's like i i mean that's like i I don't think most people would actually want that even if they think they do you know well you know it's very vulnerable stuff too you know you're talking about like failures or um you know sickness um yeah. that's 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 you know not everybody is on i don't think anybody's on here being like i had the most glorious life you know <laughs> nobody's really <laughs> saying that and I, I you know but that's the thing it's like you you got you just get more get a uh they say one thing and but then you kind of see where they're at how they feel about it and but then why age is like a fine wine is like seeing kind of where they were at when they're in their young in their early 20s into their 30s into their 40s it all kind of uh meshes into this uh shifting story which is you know that's everybody's life everybody uh, has different points in their life and they think different things as they grow up one thing that i thought was interesting and i'm glad i read about it was you know there is like and maybe this goes back to the time period when it was uh first started is that there wasn't enough women um you know, in the mix. And I, th- I think the director had said that he, that was one of the things he wishes he could have changed about the series is that they had more women. Um, but the other thing that I liked about this particular installment uh, is he did look at like some of his own shortcomings when there's that scene with the woman who um, I forget her name now, but she was talking about how she didn't like one of the questions that he asked, which was basically like, Oh, if you're getting married Jacqueline. now, yeah, yeah. Jacqueline. if you're getting married now, do you feel like you didn't have enough experience with other men or something? She was, she was like, and he explored it really well. I thought in this, you know, like why she was upset because they come back to it. It looks like they explored it in the the forty, uh, forty three up or maybe the fifty, um, and she was pissed at that time. And then they brought it up again, you know, uh, at sixty three, which I thought was like it was pretty good that he went there again, you know. Yeah, like he was, he wanted her to know, like what, what, uh, made her so, uh, uh, unhappy with that, with that statement, with that question. It's just because it obviously hid her in a part, uh, that uh, again, something she believed and she wanted to express that. And so that's why he, uh, kind of brought it back up, uh, in later years. So, um, yeah, she was an interesting one. It's like, I mean, everybody, uh, everybody's interesting. Uh, that's again like the the more it goes the more interesting people get was there were there any other um ones that stood out to you uh, uh off the top of your head um i i i did like kind of seeing the guy who uh had to face a sickness and how he had mentioned you know i have throat cancer and so okay so that's nick what were you going to say? That's Nick. No, uh, that's okay. Um, yeah. So Nick has mentioned that he has throat cancer. And then that was really interesting to be able to see somebody talk about their mortality and also sickness and the way it affects other people around you. Um, yeah. I like that he was able to to talk about that and say, you know, I'm not so much worried about myself, but it's more so the people that I'm leaving behind, uh, which was a very good nugget of truth i think you know once you're sick it's i don't think a lot of people realize that unless you've gone through something kind of traumatic is that you stop you maybe it's different for everyone of course but you start to think a little bit more about the people around you and the people that care about you and the burden that this might be on them instead of uh anything that you have to go through yourself yeah uh i mean obviously uh, a downer to i don't know if you heard but nick has passed away uh yeah. since the filming of this so that's that i heard that i saw that on the new uh when i was googling this uh a year or two ago and so that was just in the last like 12 or uh 18 months and so that one 
yeah, that was kind of a big deal rewatching this too. So um, yeah, that'll be explored a little bit more if they make another one. But yeah, you yeah, know, it's like these are uh, it's 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 tough to watch sometimes because again, like getting up there now with uh, it being in their sixties, you, you start seeing this uh, the realities of life. Unfortunately, I mean, it's um, good for the audience who's watching because of a lot of things but also you know we get so wrapped up in things in our daily life about you know what we think matters so yeah. when you get to see other people talk about and reflect on especially at uh 63 their life and the things that they thought were important and then the things that now are important to them uh it's really good for anyone younger to watch and say wow like i should be more present in my life and enjoy the things I have around me because, you know, this, this is constantly changing. It's constantly growing and evolving. And also, you know, that one guy who was doing the walking and he was sort of, um, unhoused for a long time. And then he became like kind of political, which is really an interesting trajectory of that guy. But he also mentioned something about, uh, his body used to be the strongest part of him, you know, mm. and now it's like not that way. And he's sort of like looking at life like, wow, I, I, what, I, I always relied on my strong body. And now that I don't have that anymore, like he seemed a little lost within that. Yeah. Yeah. That's Neil. Um, he, they end the movie with him. And that's another thing I've been kind of, uh, I was noticing on this rewatch is the placement of their stories. Uh, and their story arcs of the characters uh, is is pretty important because I mean there's some hard hitting uh, and, and just uh, tough to watch uh, segments on this and it, placing them like too early in the film or just randomly it just wouldn't work. So having Neil at the end, who's uh, been put through the ringer in his life, as you mentioned, he was homeless in his twenties. Uh, um, his struggle with mental health issues, but yeah, to get into politics, uh, is like a pastor. Uh, he's somebody who's substantially a beautiful better. home, you know, yeah. he ends up inheriting some money and has a beautiful home. Finally, you know, he seems to be doing like substantially better than he was in his youth when Michael was directing it. And I did watch, um, an interview. There's an interview from 2006. I think it's, uh, Roger Ebert interviewing Michael Apted about this series. It's uh, oh, about no 30, shit. 30 minutes. It's pretty good. And he, one of the things they talk about is Michael kind of not making predictions, but just he, he when he talks about Neil and the complete shift uh, that happened to Neil from 14 to 21 caused uh, Michael a lot of concern and that he is uh, been proven wrong that because Neil is just doing so much better than he was doing in his twenties. And so it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's Michael being vulnerable too. It's like, yeah, I've been, uh, I've known these people ever since they were seven, I've seen where they are going and where they've been. And I've had my own thoughts about like who maybe I'm a little bit more worried about than others. And so to see him kind of being proved wrong with that with Neil is pretty awesome. Yeah, totally. That's really cool. Um, I have to look for that. I didn't know that that was out there. Um, Ebert, I, this was, e I, that's probably how I got turned on to it. Maybe by Ebert recommendation. He was like obsessed with these movies. Uh, yeah, uh, I read that. Loved them. Yeah. 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 There was yeah, I think um, even in life itself, there's a scene when he's handing like his stepdaughter or his niece or somebody. He's, he's in the hospital. Giving oh, the upstairs. I think you're right. Yeah. He's given her a DVD and he's talk, and that's the DVD that he's given her is the upstairs and kind of describing it. He's like, hey, you should be watching this. And if, if Ebert is giving you a movie on his, on his deathbed uh, to watch, that's probably one you should check out. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. You mind if I do a quick aside on that, basically? Because it's yeah, a good point. Um, this podcast so been, all, is all aside. So. <laughs> I've been reading the Opposable Thumbs book that you gave yeah, me. Uh, nice. Thank you for this. It's beautiful. Um, I, I've been, you know... I'm not a, like as much of a avid reader as you are, but I, I love biographies and I love people's stories, which is why I think it's great. We're covering the up series here um, because that, that it's just my favorite learning. You know, I'm kind of more um, uh, interested in real stories than I am fictional. Although of course I love the movies. So, you know, uh, that's not entirely true, but you know, I love to read something that isn't, um fiction and when i was reading this book uh i came across uh, i'm in just about to go to chapter 11 which is called the Bal balcony is closed and i i know you haven't read through it yet so i'm not going to spoil anything but speaking of um championing films and stuff like that there's a documentary called uh 
I watched it last night, and that's why I want to talk about it. It's called Gates of Heaven. Have you heard of Gates of Heaven? Uh, I'm definitely familiar with it. I've never watched it. It's, okay. People love it. Yeah. Well, so it's a big part of um, them talking about how Cisco and Ebert was able to, you know, a movie that no one would have gone to see or a movie that, you know, definitely was under the radar or losing money or whatever, all of a sudden is open for a year straight because they talked about it and championed it and said how great it was. And both Cisco and Ebert both loved Gates of Heaven. And it's very much, it's kind of like this, you know, it's kind of like uh, a slice of like uh, American life that you just didn't know existed in a world that sort of is unlike your own uh and it's about a pet cemetery and yeah. you know the 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 people within it and the interviews are very long they don't cut very often uh i watched it last night and it's kind of like this you know it's like you kind of have to sit down with it and and invest yourself into like these stories because you're not going to get the flash cuts you know you know it's not it's, the format is definitely they talk a lot in opposable thumbs about formats and like them predicting the way that we are living now um mm. which is really yeah. great uh but that's kind of like the thing going back and watching a movie like the up series or this uh documentary uh i just gates of heaven that i just talked about um, you you have to be invested in in the movie. You know you have to put your phone away. You have to like really listen to what's going on to get the most out of it. Yeah. Uh, but it's always cool to see other people's you know paths and how that relates to your life. And you know movies like 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 uh, Ebert famously said was that, you know they generate empathy for the human race and everything and it's it's really you know what you sit there and you watch these things and you think what if i had cancer throat cancer how would i react you know it's like you can't like live in that world of like it's going to happen to me one day but when it does happen how do you deal with it how do you look back on your life you know it makes you, it, it asks you a lot of questions um, about how you're living and so i really love that you know uh also, Gates of Heaven is really great for looking at people's overconfidence sometimes and uh, also mm. very much like uh, trying to make uh, themselves um, heroes in their father's eyes. And, and, and you know, it, but it's about Pet Cemetery. you know, uh, there's a, it, the characters in it are really amazing. And I, I've seen some uh, quotes on Ebert about it. And he's like, I've seen it like 30 times. And oh, shit. Yeah, he's like, I've seen this film like 30 times and I can't, half the time I'm still trying to figure out what this is about and half the time I'm thinking how absurd it is and, and then, you know, half the time I'm thinking about how brilliant it is. So there's a lot to offer. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I they have it on Tubi. Uh, mm. That's the only place that's streaming right now uh, for free, at least. A lot of people loving Tubi lately. I think their, their, horror, their horror collection is pretty strong, I think. It and is. A lot of people like it. So yeah. I haven't used it myself personally too much. but I mean, at this point, yeah. too, you know, you think about it like Amazon's adding, even if you have a Prime account, they're adding, like, you got to pay us extra to get rid of the ads. It's like, well, but there's Tubi and they have ads and maybe I'll right. go watch it over there instead, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. everything's kind of the equal playing field now. The slow descent of everything that streaming promised is going away. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't mean to do that aside. I just thought it was a good, like, little part to to mention that because i know ebert did the same thing with the up series and talked about him like we mentioned uh which is really great you know god so so cool to read this book and uh, a lot of good stuff in it you'll really I, mean, I know you i know you're the one who bought it for me but uh I, i'm like halfway through it here and uh getting a lot out of it love it love to hear it um yeah no i mean going back to what you're saying like yeah watching these movies it's like and it sounds like the same with kids i have it's like you can't help but just be self-reflective like while you're watching it like you're, yeah. you're invested in their lives but like nobody in the series is leaving leading like a life that is drastically different from most people uh to some degree or the other so you can certainly identify with a lot of stuff that people are going through it uh, uh, throughout the whole time so uh as you uh, are watching their young faces and that's the other thing like as the series goes on it's like it's such beautiful editing of like because they're always using the footage from the old one. So you see their young face at seven and within like 20, uh, 30 seconds, you're already seeing their face at 63. Um, and it goes back and forth. And just that editing is just uh, something that keeps on making these uh, later ones like so much more interesting. So yeah. and again, that's nothing you can do in any other medium, you know, like you yeah. can't, 
you can't write about it. You can write about it, but it's certainly not going to be that same experience at all. So I guess that's something that AI can't generate is uh, a story about <sighs> someone's life. Uh, <laughs> well, I was totally thinking watching this on the rewatch. I'm like, I wonder if like in 10 years when AI is this, like, what is AI going to do in terms of credibility? Like if somebody's watching, uh, you know, in 10, 20 years, if somebody's watching 63 up for the first time, uh, are they even really going to believe that this was a, a documentary that took decades to film? Because you will be able to just create something like that. Show me the face of a seven-year-old, then show me the face at 14. And it's almost, like, I was just thinking about that, just like, it almost feels like the credibility is uh, under fire uh, in terms of like somebody watching this for the first time. And just, I mean, that's a larger question for AI, but like the fact that the images are old because they were filmed in the sixties. So it's not going to be that hard to recreate that image now. So, well, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know if you see this, but a lot of times when I know that there's been something that uh, I'm sure it's going to get harder to detect, but when you see something that people do like post up on social media, it, like already, it's already like a, you know, social media is a cesspool of a lot of bullshit that you just try to weed through. And I think it's going to make a lot more people, um, disenchanted with social media as a whole yeah. but because it's already got a lot of shit that you got to weed through everybody's a creator everybody's got some sort of like agenda you know about me 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 yeah. and uh at some point i think it's going to be really hard for people not to notice like the fake bullshit ai you know or maybe the opposite it's going to be hard to weed it out right now i can tell you know when yeah. i see people make show flyers um like I used to put together by hand all the time for my bands now yeah. is, uh, you know, generated by AI and you can just definitely tell, you know, this is, Oh, it's an AI generated, you know, flyer. And that's great for people who need to like get out the marketing and stuff like that. But, you know, most people that are truly artistic can see that and feel it and know how disingenuous it is. Like you said, um, I don't know if the, technology is going to get so good that you won't be able to tell anymore. And that I guess is the question you're saying, like, will we be able to know that AI did this and not a real person, you know? Uh, I mean, we don't have to go down the AI path too much, but yeah, like I, from what I understand, I think there will have to be some sort of uh, like um, forced uh marker of like if you create some of ai something is going to have to be easily noted like in the corner like a watermark or something that like this is created by ai and not by a person because otherwise yeah it's like it's just a, a free-for-all for I mean, nobody's, get, nobody's gonna put that on there unless true uh, i mean yeah unless it's a, like a law or something like that um but I don't know how that would work. But I mean, that just, I, I, I remember hearing about that and being thinking that I guess that's the pathway that some people see as a potential uh, way of not uh, bringing down society in terms of what's real and what's not. Yeah. We already, we already don't know what's real and what's not. So I guess we've already gone down that pathway. So, well, you know, there's a lot of times too, like with different parts of life, like, I don't know, I'm at the age now where I think everything that I do should matter. Every piece of art that I make should matter, should be somehow important to the world or reflect on the world somehow or connect with people. And I still think that's a human element that you have to inject, no matter if you're creating with AI or not, like you have to understand how it's going to connect with people. And so I don't know, that's still a way to like, tell the good from the bad regardless like you have to connect with the audience and you know that's what we talk about all the time here every week or every two weeks on this podcast is how are these be how are the how is this connecting with people you know we love movies just like Sis siskel and ebert love movies you know and uh we talk every week because we want to connect with other people about the movies you know and what it meant to them their lives we've been getting such uh cool comments lately and sometimes it's people that don't agree with us at all uh on youtube and i, I really love it like i'm just like wow people are actually like this is kind of like the suncoast thing that we talk about all the time you know we just <laughs> yeah. want to like talk yeah. with people about the movies you know it's it of course we found each other and thank god that you know we can still do this together but opening up the door to other people talking about you know you you know i love that 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 point and did you know and then i'm like oh shit i didn't know you know and that's 
what a great way to experience art is to like talk about it. That's the beauty of movies. It's kind of a, a improv. It's yes. And you're just like, Oh yeah, that's great. And then check this shit out. So, right. I mean, I constantly <laughs> yes. tell. Yeah. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, I don't even agree with my own opinions half the time. So I don't, I don't mind that other people disagree with them. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, sometimes you prove yourself wrong too. Like yeah. the up series here, you know, like the version of myself in Suncoast in my twenties, when I was talking with you about a movie, I remember very vividly being very anti Western and it's not like I'm super pro Western now, but I definitely don't like dismiss it like I used to until Ben, if you remember Ben, he gave me the Dollars trilogy that came out on DVD. It had the three Ooh. movies in it. Oh, yeah. And I watched those for the first time. I would never forget like the feeling of watching those in my bedroom and just like really being involved in them. And I'm like, this makes sense. Why did I not? You know, you you inherently as a person just kind of like shy away from stuff or think you might not like it. But if you give it a chance, it's like it could surprise you. Yeah. Yeah, you develop trust with the recommendations from the people who was doing it. Um, oh, man, I'm excited for the Morricone Fest. I sent you a link, a music box. It's going to have the whole Dollars Trilogy on a Saturday. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. The Vista That's just did a, a double feature, a few dollars more and Fistful oh. of Dollars. Yeah, oh, I didn't okay. see it. I still have yet to see a fucking movie there. I've gone to, to, to uh, Pam's Coffee, which just opened up, like right next door to it. It's uh, the coffee shop. That's Tarantino's sh coffee shop. And I uh, got a coffee the other day. It was fucking awesome. So great. But I have yet to see it. Uh, I just haven't had any time to go in there and actually see it now that it's revamped. Oh, so that's right. Yeah, you sent me a picture of that. That's right next to the Vista. Uh, yeah. The coffee uh, that's awesome. That's, yep, a, good, that's so, a good one-two combo uh, for Friday night. So <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Tarantino is like killing it, you know, with yeah. like uh, a lot of people hate that. Uh, I love it. It's like you've spent your life making cool, creative, artistic things, and now you're capitalizing on it. Like, of course, people love it. Yeah, this. but that's not even really, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a coffee shop. That's not that's i mean i i jokingly uh told like uh text you back they're like oh yeah that guy's a sellout now i was mostly <laughs> referencing the fact that there is that there the idea of selling out barely even exists but also the fact that having a coffee shop is miles away from <laughs> capital i think uh, it's pretty far from just capitalizing on your brand there are plenty of other things you could be doing uh for money it could be branding his own credit card if he wanted to i think yeah that's true i mean it's and it's obviously about you know pam greer it's pam's coffee c-o-f-f-y you know it's Ooh, a nice. nice play on it and i'm you know in this town people love the fucking movies so it's like oh. why not you know love it uh well let's wrap up by talking about influences a little bit and you mentioned it at the beginning but link later i mean link later like uh his movies are completely indebted to like this series and just specifically the before trilogy and obviously uh boyhood and just watching those movies uh because i had seen this series first and then watched the before trilogy and boyhood came out after and so I, I honestly just made those movies better in my eyes, like kind of understanding like that this uh, series existed and I'm sure how much of an influence it had on Linklater because those are his two biggest ones. But like, when you think about it, like most of his movies all, have all been about time in some sort of manner, like Slacker in terms of like it being a documentary at the time. Um, Days and Confused is one of those kind of uh, a, a moment single, in time a single day you know it's just yeah. a, a, a a single day in a group of people and it's just it's he's always had uh, a focus on time and dialogue uh that at least that's what i see is that reoccurring uh through line for him so uh yeah like you said influences i mean i haven't seen if he's actually said specifically that these movies uh were a big influence but i'm sure they were and there's no way that he didn't know they at least existed so yeah, yeah so and i mean let's just say this is a documentary style which is very british and it's very it's about you know class system and it's very dry sometimes that way you know a very british documentary where like <laughs> you know you kind of have people just like uh talking the way they do it's, it's it's different than an american documentary i would say in that respect there's like a little bit of a style to that um 
and not dry in a bad way, just dry in like a British way, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, Steve Coogan way. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, not but that's <laughs> not the, at that least Steve, yeah. yeah, Steve yeah. Coogan at least has the the jokes uh, involved. But <laughs> um, this this is a little straightforward, and at times, you know, you can kind of see like some Wes Anderson, like you know, pulling out like those interviews of like it. Actually, Gates of Heaven. I'm talking about British, but I mean, Gates of Heaven is very much like that. You could like almost see like. Wes Anderson watching interviews from that and like pulling yeah. it into his films. Cause it's just like the way that people are and like the way that they react. Uh, yeah. It's funny. Like that cutting away that Wes Anderson style where they just cut back to somebody's past. That That is a good point. I'm thinking back of Tony at the beginning. There's a, there's a scene when they filmed it when he was seven and he just is running and he just face plants. Yeah. And the way he cuts that Michael cuts it in this movie, it's like, Michael's just, he's, he's talking about something and it's just kind of like uh, something that is left in the air. And then he just cuts right to the seven-year-old him just falling flat on his face. <laughs> it's kind of like like yeah. the uh, Margot uh, where they talk yeah. about like the finger. And it's yeah. like goes back to like the chopping of the, the thing. It's like it happens in a split second, but it's like amazing, you know? I always think about those as far in terms of shoots. It's like this was like a whole like expense to do this like little like vignette, you know, that, right. that lasts two two seconds. All right. We're just going to cut to the third Wilson cutting off your finger. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Future man. Be, yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> so good. Oh, God. We got to do some uh, Wes Anderson in the future. But uh, yeah, I'm really glad you brought this to my um, table today because, you know, as much as I've I, it is weird because I don't know where we talked about this, but it stuck with me for so long that you liked the these movies and again maybe it's just because of the idea of them like it's it was so yeah and and you bring up a good point like nowadays it's kind of like everybody's on social media you have like a log of your whole life in you know a different way but you have a log of your whole life on instagram now so let's say like your parents started you an instagram you know now like you're seven and you can do it your on your own so you know oh i mean God. people fucking do that uh, i don't know if you remember my song i see your kids growing up online from uh 2019's notifications record that i made but that was the point like you know from the perspective of i see your kids growing up online and I, I remember when we used to talk about our kids you know and let's like but now i see them doing all this thing you know uh i love that record so i apologize for giving myself a little props there it's like i love the way that i look at social media sometimes that way and it's kind of like watching these films um it's looking into like people's lives and what they think are important you know, at some point, something is going to disrupt their lives. And now this part of their lives won't be important anymore. You know, uh, like when you get that first house, you know, oh, this is like all people will post about. Uh, I, we moved into our new home. Check out this new thing, blah, blah, blah. And then somebody <laughs> dies. And right. now they don't post about that anymore. You know, uh, that's kind of a tangent. That I, I'm always, on, but, I always, yeah. uh, I think, I mean, continue with that. It is kind of interesting. I think like when somebody just stops posting, yeah, uh, that's either meaning they're living their best life or their worst life. Oh, true. Yeah. You know, they've either had an issue where they just, I got to step away and just not post anything, or they've realized mm, this is not where it's at posting myself every single day. So they're either, and it's just like, maybe if, it's if a somebody stops posting, they're either doing really well or kind of really struggling. So totally. I, I love thinking about that too. Like, or just talking <laughs> about it here today. Cause it's like, you know, when I have something to post or share with my art, it's kind of the only thing I'm concerned about these days back, you know, there's been different times in my life where it's like, I'm posting because I want the ex-girlfriend to see, like, I'm living this great life or whatever, you know, uh, or that, you know, that was a time in my life when I did that, or there was yeah. a time in my life where I was like, um, uh, so depressed that I was like, I can't even look at other people's stuff. I got to get off this. I delete all the apps. You know, I think all of us have those things and we're trying, it's, it's a big experiment, you know, kind of like, uh, the up series is it's a big experiment social media and how we're going to react to it you know god i hate to say it but i'm sure there's been people that have been so depressed from social media that they've died or they've, they've taken their own lives you know they, it's a very powerful thing uh and if you're not careful with it um it can really destroy your life and it's interesting to say that like it could be someone stops posting and then it's either that their life is really going well or it's like they can't take it anymore it, it yeah. you know there's really no in between with that it's like because now it's like oh you could have that thought i might get rid of all my social media 
whenever I say that and think about that, it's like, yeah, this is all bullshit. It's like, everyone's doing AI. It doesn't matter, whatever. But then I'm like, what? I have a business, you know, I want people to know about my art. Uh, how am I going to do that? It's like, well, I could do my best to be out in the world and, you know, be on the walls, which is like totally my focus. But I also, you need to be where people are these days. And a lot of times that's social media. So um, it's, a, it's a great experiment that is still ongoing. Great in quotes. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely okay. it's definitely an experiment. I'll give you that. So, uh, well, you know, and I'll, yeah. I'll tell you just in, from for me, you know, I I love to read, and if you didn't send me these books, I I wouldn't probably pick them up myself. But I, it's like the this is so much better than going and cruising all night long right before bed on social media. And nowadays, I'll just pick up my book and read read these great books. But one thing that I love about your social media presence, which is you know not as much as mine, it's not as a. Uh, uh, furious as mine as uh, it can be, but like, I love that you recommend books to people. So there are like really a lot of good things about social media to, to take out from, you know, being on there. It's like, I guess you just have to know where to look. It's very true. Can't argue with that. Uh, so yeah, kind of back to the up series. Uh, yeah. Predicting all this stuff uh, with the, the way we follow each other's lives since the sixties. So uh, that's why, again, why it's like a pretty pivotal series. It's one I love. And again, the more you, the kind of the, uh, the more you understand uh, how these characters have been in people's lives for so long, you kind of get an idea of why it's been so powerful. I mean, do you want to see a new installment of the up yeah, series? Yeah, definitely. Uh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, I know he would have wanted to, but again, it's like, if, if none of them actually wanted to participate, then, then no, then I wouldn't. Care. Yeah. Like I, I would only want to watch it if they're uh, want to do it, but I would certainly enjoy following uh, them into their to their uh, golden age for sure. So great, yeah, is what it all is. Right. Hopefully, well, it doesn't go. turn into a Truman Show. That's all we watch. We just don't <laughs> want them to be forced into being taped. Don't it? <laughs> wow, we're gonna have to do a Peter Weir series now. That uh, oh, about Truman yeah, Show. okay. Well, let's just wrap up. Uh, the up series 63 up love the movie glad you enjoyed it peter weir man i fucking love peter weir oh he, shit i forgot about you and master and commander oh my god that is absolutely on a list of uh, movies we'll be watching soon i for, i totally forgot that you were like dude you got to watch fucking master and commander yeah master I, I and really commander is so goddamn good so there's actually one an early one it's on criterion that i've never watched um brighton rock What's it called? Is it Brighton Rock? Mm, never heard I'm of it. I'm forgetting the name of it. Uh, I'll look it up. But Peter Weir, between that and Truman Show and Dead Poet Society. Yeah. I mean, so you said you have not seen um, Master and Commander. I have not. No. Uh, again, I think we talked about this uh, uh, off, off air or whatever you want to say when uh, we were talking about you know, the film. That was around the time Pirates of the Caribbean came out. Right. It's just a movie that was, uh, I mean, it did huge. It got like 10, 11 Oscar nominations and it did okay in the box office, but it just is not a movie that was like totally remembered at the time. But like, it fortunately has its huge fan base now because it is so fucking good. Uh, the way it just, it, it, it really is just the friendship between uh, uh, um, uh, Russell Crowe and the uh, doctor. And it, it's, it's so well made in such an old school film way that uh yeah i absolutely love that movie awesome yeah i i know that that's another one that stuck out in my mind of you saying like you got to see this fucking movie you know yeah um panic at hanging rock is one that i haven't seen that is supposed to be fantastic it's an early one uh when he was still in australia in 1975 it's an early one that was in the um criterion collection and i almost picked it up the other day but uh it's supposed to be awesome i just haven't seen it yet so i'm looking forward to that um those australian directors him and russell mckay it's where it's at love it i wanted to uh talk quickly about uh so yeah we're moving on from this is the segment of our show where we talk a little bit about what we've been doing and what we've been seeing what we've been consuming and so you know 
speaking of how's your life darren well speaking of different <laughs> movies that i've been watching uh i've been pleasantly surprised with shutter lately uh oh. because i've been uh, creeping on your shutter for the first time since like you gave me the uh the in and i you know i would i would be like oh this is like great put it on but then you know kind of walk away make dinner or whatever it's like never really sitting down there's two i told you i watched that john carpenter to toby hooper um uh, body bags body bags <laughs> fucking <laughs> yeah. so good that was yeah that's one so that doesn't good. get talked about as much because it's an anthology and he didn't direct all of them but yeah it does kind of get forgotten and but he's like the crypt keeper in it yeah. which is he's, amazing god i wish the they Rapper would have made guy. more of that you know it yeah. was so good uh i really enjoyed it <laughs> that one oh, about yeah. like the the lady who's like stuck in the uh, gas station overnight it was like the first one or whatever yeah uh god it was so well done <clears throat> i think toby uh, did that one i think shot so. really well too uh there's like some some camera work in there that i'm like damn like this is like kind of like you know is that the one west craven showed up in yes yes yeah nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of cool like little uh things and you said oh what'd you say about the oh the, the hair thing that's so fucking wild man oh <laughs> yeah. god i love that so much uh it's crazy okay and then second and this is maybe more notable for me love roger corman of course who can forget rock and roll high school starring the fantastic ramones pj souls however i had never seen humanoids from the deep before mm. and i've watched it now twice and i fucking you. loved it okay loved 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 it i'm a fan already of um creature from the black lagoon so this is sort of like his own version of creature from the black lagoon 1980 i believe is when it was filmed so right in that sweet spot of 80s uh horror and b movie roger corman it's like the sweetest spot for him uh the monsters look awesome the acting is a fucking incredible and i cannot uh recommend it more there's a lot of times where there's uh women running around uh being topless uh you know running away from these monsters it's like the Soul. classic 80 yeah i was gonna say it's the classic 80s thing that you know i, I was telling my girlfriend about it today she's like i know rolling her eyes i was like but this is like that's what i love is it's like campy b movie like roger corman throws that in there because he knows like oh people are gonna like this you know for this and there's like monsters coming at them and there's just a chaos and there's like a woman all of a sudden with her top off it's like that's the b horror movie stuff that like is just ridiculous um and so yeah see it if you haven't seen it humanoids from the deep i think you'll love it oh yeah i watched that i mean i don't remember too much of it i watched it like 20 years ago and i remember enjoying it and i know it's a classic that a lot of people love uh i, I mean i don't remember like being blown away by it so i definitely should rewatch it because i'm sure there is something there i mean, I mean dude it had like it you know how like on then, so. sh shutter it's got like whatever like however many skulls people like that one was full red it was like all five five yeah. skulls or whatever that's the shutter community so you can definitely trust them so yeah, yeah. totally <laughs> um and then i wanted to say one other thing um I, i'm not going to tell anybody who's listening to this anything they don't know but you know the great film eternal sunshine of the spotless mind is featured on criterion this month and i watched it uh and then watched it again with my girlfriend i've also recently watched pulp fiction again i've been uh kind of just really <clears throat> enjoying the films lately that i've been watching sometimes it's just rewatches but i wanted to see eternal sunshine again it had been a while and then i watched it again with my girlfriend as i mentioned and we both were just kind of like god this film is so good and the older i get the more i appreciate it and the more um i realize like how good the acting is in it um you know kind of more notably for kirsten dunst who at the time was like this big star that had just come off of doing spider-man and i don't think at the time i gave her enough credit but <clears throat> she's so good in it and then i wanted to segue into my song of the week from that film which i didn't realize so like a lot of it is john bryan i believe uh doing the score uh who's also done a lot of work with um elliot smith and uh he also did the mac miller record the last record that mac miller did um yeah. he is somebody who 
had done uh, a little snippet on that song one two three four by the plain white tees actually too so he's he's been around he used to perform at largo from what i've heard from my girlfriend all the time uh really well known around here and um you'll notice his musical style right away especially like when you watch you know this film you'll you'll kind of get the vibe but uh it's not his song there's one song in it that's an original by beck and i didn't realize mm. that beck was the singer of the song and it was like you know seeing it this time watching the ending and hearing that voice i was like okay i gotta like find out is that who it did this song you know and i looked it up and it was back and so the um yeah, you know, I've never, I know the exact song you're thinking of. Yeah, of so, it's the, so it's the ending song you're saying. That's, yeah, I've yep. always kind of uh, known in the back of my mind that was Beck, but I, Did you? I, I never, I mean, I've never listened to the soundtrack or looked it up. I like Beck. I just, you know, never. Well, uh, same. So, like, yeah. I like Beck fine, you know, I'm yeah. sure there's a bunch of songs I know that I don't even know are Beck, and this is one of them. And uh, it's kind of like, it's such a beautiful, it, I, again, you watch these films and then these songs become so perfect because you think about the film and the moments in the film and that's what i do when i listen to this song everybody's got to learn sometimes I, I was gonna say that's the everyone's i know that that line just like sticks with you for sure at the end of that movie everyone's gonna lo lose sometimes right yeah that's like, it yeah he's like change your heart it will astound you you know that kind of stuff and it's like whoa and then they're just showing the it, it fades to white actually and they're showing the scene of them on the beach in the snow over and over uh beautiful moment beautiful song and so that's my song of the week everyone's got to learn sometimes yeah I was, thinking, I was remembering it as lose so um yeah that's i haven't seen that we actually went to go see that in the theater uh we saw a screening of that years ago uh, yeah it was the last time i watched that um, yeah. But yeah 2004 that was, man um yeah i saw it when it first came out that's always been you know that's a that's an absolute classic there's have you not seen that, it so. since no no I, when you and i went to go see it maybe like five or six years ago we went to go see a screening of it uh somewhere here in chicago i forget yeah maybe at soho oh maybe yeah i yeah. think it was at soho yeah 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 and i forgot about that it was probably early on in my membership there because it was yeah. uh like they would they do those great screenings yeah um but yeah that well, one that screening it was like i mean it, 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 i've always loved that movie so yeah um you so you can't you can't argue with it it's an it's an absolute classic yeah i've been enjoying that song uh on my walks lately and just kind of thinking about that movie and putting placing myself into a good state of mind of like not wanting to erase any memories uh this is the great thing about that film it's like even the bad ones are perfect you know mm, love it well, I've been watching a lot of '90s movies. That's where my mind's been at lately. So, I wow, she's all that. Uh... Oh yeah, total <laughs> classic. Uh, I did watch Twister uh, for the first time in probably 20 years. Uh, a little Philip Seymour Hoffman action. Bill Paxton can never. It's a, it's a slice uh, of watching movies from the '90s because it really it was a different world. Just the editing and the style and just how everything was just kind of felt way more uh, B movie. Even the big stuff. Um, so I rewatched that or watch speed uh and then Damn. yeah speed's great speed's an absolute classic still i mean and, that's the, that's that's the quintessential 90s right that's uh, um both jan de bont actually he was uh he worked on die hard and then he directed speed and twister uh so he, wow. he was definitely crushing uh the 90s yeah uh and then the third 90s movie i watched i uh, love the most um because i forgot how good it was is the edge uh with anthony hopkins and um Alec Baldwin. Oh, they, right. You texted me about that. I've never seen. Yeah, it's it's so I remember seeing it as a kid, but like as a kid, I was just like, this is a cool movie with a giant bear attacking these two guys. <laughs> but then like as an adult, I mean, it's a script written by David Mamet, uh, you know, like Glenn, right. Glenn Ross. And it's so much. I mean, it is still like a B movie action thriller with these two guys who just get lost in the woods. But it's so much. It's got a lot of nuances that I definitely did not pick up as a kid. Um, and just in terms of survival and purpose, and uh, it's a great script. Uh, and it's it's so fun. Like it's crazy to watch. Them. Like the fact that in the '90s you have two A-list actors sign on to a movie where they're literally fighting a bear 
It was Bart the Bear. He was like, he was like, he was actually at the Oscars. Like, if you ever saw a movie with a bear in the 80s or 90s, it was the same bear. It was Bart the Bear. Um, and it's so well done. And they, they're literally just fighting a bear. And just like the idea of the, that type of movie happening now is is it would just never happen. Certainly yeah, not but, like, with a real bear. So, so yeah, I, you well, you know bringing up uh thoughts of the revenant here you know <laughs> dicaprio getting fucking oh, that's right. i saw that so i saw that once in the theater and i was okay with it i haven't thought about it once since then is it do you like it you, you say you didn't like the movie i was okay with it i was fine with it, it oh the good. movie's fucking great is dude. it good okay. god damn it yeah i haven't the thought revenant, about it dude like- yeah, I don't know. I, Isn't that I mean, scene where he's getting his ass kicked by the bear? I've seen a clip of that. I know it's a big CGI bear. I, I know it's. I'm not saying I didn't it's like it. It's not Bart the Bear. That's for sure. No, no, yeah, that, no, so no. definitely. Nobody's Bart the Bear. So yeah, um, I'll watch I hope it Bart again. the Bear's got to get some fucking credit in our liner notes for sure. I didn't even know that there was Bart the Bear. I didn't oh. know he was at the Oscars. I didn't know anything about this. Bart the Bear probably has like. I don't know how many credits, but he's got, again, like think of any movie from the eighties or nineties that had a bear and it was Bart the bear. So, wow. Holy shit. I mean, he was in the movie. Um, it was called the bear. It was like, he had his own movie from the eighties. I know that much. Wow. He died in 2000, 1977 to 2000. He's got his his own IMDB page. So, (laughs) Uh, the Edge, The Great Outdoors, uh, The Bear from 1988, Legends of the Fall. Uh, Damn, he was in a film with Brad Pitt. Twelve Monkeys on Deadly Ground, White Fang. Uh, yeah, he was he was uh, animal royalty for uh, Hollywood. So, well, actually, <laughs> that's a big talking about The Edge. This would be Anthony Hopkins' second time acting with Bart the Bear because he was in yeah. Legends of the Fall as well. Oh, I never saw Legends of the Fall. I mean, yeah, he played. Guess, guess who he played in Legends of the Fall? The, the bear. bear. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I thought I, I guess get it, that one right. I guess that's half as his credits as Davis had. So it makes sense. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, so good. So yeah, nineties. It's been uh, nice to revisit uh, a different uh, slice of movies um, and if from another time. Shit happened in the '90s that are, is never going back to that style again. So, in terms of B movie style, so yeah. And if you and again, if you haven't seen The Edge and you want to see Anthony Hopkins punch a bear, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think everyone does. Uh, I was going to say. So, is your song "More Than Words" by? Uh, um, I forget the name of that band because you're so '90s right now. What is your song of the week? Uh, mine's from the. Or is 60s. it "Everything Zen" by Bush or what? Oh, Bush is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going '90s for music. I'm going jazz actually. Uh, Damn. I've been, in a, been in a jazz mood lately, which is not normal. Uh, I'm not normally all in on jazz. I'm more classical, but I do enjoy jazz. I do like Jay McShann. Um, I came across uh, some of his stuff. Uh, I mean, I've heard him a long time ago, and it pops up every once in a while. I know I got turned on to him somehow, probably through a film, but I don't remember what. But Blues and Sentimental uh, is a track from Jay McShann from, I believe, the uh, 68. The vocals in it? No, it's entirely instrumental, which is the type of jazz that I definitely prefer. Uh, okay. Kind of the more slow vibe jazz uh, instrumental. That's definitely what I enjoy the most uh, when it comes to that. And blues and sentimental is totally my jam when it comes to uh, the vibe of jazz that I enjoy. So Jay McShan, blues and sentimental. So they'll add a nice little glint to the uh, uh, rock and metal that I've been contributing to lately. So Yeah, I mean, this is I as we talk about every week, uh, if you don't know anything about our uh remainders jukebox you got to get into it it is the most eclectic list of songs you're ever going to find i mean it really is uh songs that kick ass is the recurring through line anything songs that, that kick ass anything after that is open for uh is game so 100 percent um in closing are we ready to close it out uh this episode of remainders Ah, I think I'm good. I'm going to rewatch Tenet tonight. They re Okay, well, it. I still have not seen. Oh, it's, I saw in the theater. Uh, I had no idea, like everybody else, that I, I did not understand it at all, but I know I enjoyed it enough 
uh, to want to watch it again. And again, like it's, if anybody else made it, if it was like somebody's first time movie, I'd be like, this guy's a hack, but like it, it being Nolan, I'm like, I guarantee it's just a movie that I'm going to have to rewatch multiple times uh, to kind of fully appreciate it. And in this re-release, it, it was kind of popping on Twitter. Like a lot of people were being like, wait a minute, we totally slept on this movie when it first came out. And this is a kick-ass Nolan movie. So mm. I'm excited. To, I've already watched a few scenes, but this will be the first time I've rewatched it in full since. Have you seen uh, a mo- uh, music box? Uh, no, it's just at the AMC. It just got re- re-released wide, uh, nationwide for like a week. Um, mm. I'm not sure what the reason was, but you know, wasn't this a pandemic uh, movie? Kind of came yeah, out during the pandemic. Came, it was like one of the first waves of them trying to reopen theaters, uh, uh, and so it didn't do too well because of that. And everybody was just like, "I don't understand this movie at all." Which you know, gotcha. I, I totally. That's how. That's the camp I was. Well, in. good yeah. art always ages well. So let us but know. It, next but time I do what you love thought. like what he was like. I'm okay with not understanding a movie, like, and especially like I said coming from Nolan, it's like if he is setting out to make a movie that you're not really going to fully understand i mean like it's in the dialogue it's like don't try to think about it just feel it like it, they say it out loud in the movie it's like you're not going to understand everything it's more of a vibe it's more of like a hangout movie uh because the actually understanding the physics of the movie or the plot itself is almost uh, useless wow yeah so <laughs> Looking forward to, to that. It. So yeah, yeah, I have to see it. I mean, um, if anything, it's just an interesting movie to watch because of like how uh, incomprehensible it is. So, and again, well, it's no, it's no one. You can't. You, I mean, you have to give no one at least a chance. Uh, he's proven himself time and time again with that. So, I wanted to uh, to end the episode with a. Uh, do you mind if I do a little pa- uh, read a little passage from uh, this opposable thumbs book? Um, it's just a quick little uh, paragraph. Absolutely, um, that'll brighten my day for sure. Yeah, I just I just wanted to read this because um it kind of goes with what you're saying you know a lot of times it's like we'll read the headline but never read anything else or listen to anything or experience anything else or like you know people are talking about this this way and so that must be true um and this was way back you know when Cisco and Ebert were living and working and I thought this was really cool and maybe a good way to end this episode it's a he he, he was talking in the the context of this is that uh, Bob Dole had, was attacking Hollywood and movies and saying like, okay, you know, they're trying to corrupt our youth. Uh, you know, the, the things that are being made are this, that, and the other. And so Ebert's slapback uh, <laughs> was to say that a movie or a song contains something is not to make a meaningful statement about it, except simply to say what it contains. Ebert explained. I think you have to look a little further into tone, mood, message, purpose, context, and origin in order to understand whether a movie or a song has a message that's worthwhile or whether it's simply negative and destructive. And that's something I think that Senator Dole and other people who have joined this cause have not been willing to do. Instead, Siskel said, Dole was trying to divide people by creating a boogeyman for people to fear. One, Ebert argued, that deliberately invoked rap music as code words designed to make his core constituency think of drug-crazed young black men in the ghetto with guns shooting cops. That what That's what he thinks of us, Ebert said. He probably is not interested in the fact that 95% of rap music doesn't have anything to do with the kinds of targets he's singled out. What he's basically saying is trying to draw a wedge. He's trying to say these terrible people over there are perverting our, and then uh, it goes on. But I just thought that was so great for a little moment to say, fucking put your phones down and watch <laughs> a movie or listen to a song and don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, that's It's so important. You, know? you can't get the whole story by just reading the headline. Man, that is impactful. Uh, no, I mean, yeah. No censorship, especially in art. Uh, that's definitely one of uh, my biggest things in life. So yeah, and if get you fully behind that, so. need to hear more about it from that time period. Go listen to the song "Censor Shit" by the Ramones. <laughs> <laughs> and on nice. that note, it was Love great it. talking with you. Uh, finally, getting to see the Up series. Thanks for bringing that to the table. We'll see everybody back here 
in two weeks time with a new awesome movie to discuss. If you have some comments and you want to tell us what you thought of the up series, uh, please let us know. We're on remainders.com remainderspod.com where you can find all of our socials and at remainders pod, easy to find us, easy to talk to us. And we always love reading and interacting with you about the movies. Hell yeah. Always a pleasure, Darren. You too. Talk to you soon. See you, bud. Bye.